So uh, thanks for that introduction. And um, I just wanted to start off by saying that if you read the description for this talk, it said it was about David Hockney. Um, but this talk is not really about David Hockney. Um, I will get to him. Um, but what this talk is really about um, is this question that kind of um, interests and plagues me on a daily basis, um, which is within the category of art and technology, what is useful and important to make um, asterisk to me. Um, and just for context, I'm from, I was born in Cupertino. My parents worked in tech. I feel very close to that whole universe. Um, and so I'm especially privy to the ways in which art and technology um, has been misunderstood as an identifiable category, which incidentally is ripe for fetishization, uh, just like the category of technology in general. Um, and if anyone here, I'm sure there are a lot of people from the Bay Area, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so fighting against that current has brought me to a provisional answer to that question, what is useful and interesting to make, and this is my very scientific drawing, um, <laughs> which is that uh, it might be useful and inter interesting to use digital tools um, to create a kind of digital prosthesis that allows, at the end of the day, deeper access to the world rather than an escape from it. And interestingly, it seems like people who are able to do this are also able to alienate themselves from the intended use of a technology um, and using it to do something else. And just on a personal level, uh, this answer helps me address an inner conflict that I have about being an artist using digital tools um, because on a very real everyday level, um, being inside on a computer all day deprives me of the things that I like about being a human, um, i.e. looking at things not on a screen. Um, so to go back to this, uh, this is kind of the only, this relationship, um, this way of using technology is the only way I've been able to resolve that conflict. Um, so just using technology to augment elements of the human experience rather than flattening it or trying to replace it. So the reason I am going to talk about David Hockney for a little bit um, is because of the way um, this line of thinking was touched off or maybe catalyzed by an unexpected recent encounter with his work, which I'll explain later. Um, and this might be surprising because you, you may know him as a painter, and I certainly knew him as a painter. Um, so this talk is also about finding inspiration from someone who's working in a very different medium. Um, and these ideas I'm about to talk about have kind of been like a compass through trendy times for me <laughs> living in the Bay Area. Um, so I really um, have come back to them over and over again. Um, so first I'm going to talk about David Hockney, um, then I'll talk about some contemporary examples of other artists who are doing something I think is similar, um, and then lastly how it's changed my very recent work. Um, but first, uh, I promised you Utopian Fax Machine. Um, this is the first of two. Uh, this is an excerpt from a story that I wrote in 1994 um, about zapping, my, my Jenny in the story gets zapped through Microsoft Word. Um, into a parallel universe and meets the real Michael Jackson, um, <laughs> who we learn is a robot that was built, um, so our Michael Jackson was a robot built by the real Michael Jackson and sent through a fax machine. Um, and I, I would just contextualize this um, by the fact that the 90s were an era of zapping and wormholes and portals, uh, so I think I was probably pretty heavily influenced by that. Um, but I think it's interesting just as an example of um, the way children, but also people um, like artists or people coming from outside of a very um, familiarized uh, maybe relationship with technology tend to approach things in very strange ways and imagine really weird uses for them. Um, and it's also an example of my early obs and continuing obsession with portals. Um, so things that I was really into as a kid were the closet that leads to Narnia, um, the laser in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, um, this room in Time Bandit that grows a hallway that leads to the Napoleonic Wars, um, and the magic school bus that lets you go inside a body. Um, and I think, uh, it's Im again, it's important to note that uh, to me, it was the, the more banal, the better. Um, I wasn't you know, I was more interested in a secret thing in a room that went somewhere than, you know, getting in a spaceship and going to outer space. Um, I really liked thinking about the alien surface of a che Cheerio, um, or that you had to walk through some coats to get to Narnia. Um, and I especially liked the idea that there are limitless perspectives on, on everything, and what we find when we inhabit those will always be surprising. Um, and so it's maybe... Uh, if it follows from that, that all of the work that I've made um, engages in some way with that idea. Um, so these are um, uh, from my satellite collection series, which is um, composed of pieces of Google satellite imagery cut out and collaged together into these um, collections. Um, and uh, 
the the point here is for people to see how strange and specifically human these things are that we look at um, in an otherwise everyday context. Um, so um, you're ideally you're supposed to look at the piece um, and you know, maybe enjoy it, but then uh, ultimately um, be walking around and maybe notice things or notice um, characteristics of things that you hadn't noticed before. Just simply register it at all. Um, and so uh, the aim is really to just visually take things less for granted. Um, I really love satellite imagery, but this work is not about satellite imagery to me at the end of the day. It's about your experience after looking at it. Um, so zooming out to zoom back in again. Um, and uh, that's my way of saying that I'm <laughs> interested in art that, um, I sometimes I say art that ends outside, but it doesn't have to literally be outside, but art that ends IRL, like that, that um, has an endpoint that exists in the world and your experience of the world. So getting to David Hockney, um, basically what happened was um, earlier this year, I was asked to give a lecture at the De Young in San Francisco about David Hockney because they had a video piece, which I'll show in a minute, um, and that was considered digital art. So they wanted a digital art person to come and talk about um, David Hockney in that piece. Um, and I um, kind of freaked out because I didn't really know anything about David Hockney. I wasn't super interested in David Hockney. Um, I was like, that guy's a painter. Um, I'm a digital artist. <laughs> and like really a painter's painter. Um, and so I didn't really know what I was going to have to say about him. Um, this is probably what uh, you associate with David Hockney, if anything, um, these stylized paintings of um, landscapes in LA. Um, but I ended up finding out some stuff that ended up being more relevant to my work than maybe um, a lot of um, more overtly art and technology type things I had gone to or learned about. Um, so uh, just starting with photography, um, David Hockney started out hating photography. Um, he would use it for studies in his paintings, um, but this is a quote of his where he says, um, it's fine uh, if you don't mind looking at the world from the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops, um, which, uh, you know, there's probably some photographers here and obviously that's a painter's read of photography. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a curator in um, the early 80s came to his house um, to document some of his work um, using Polaroids and then happened to leave some blank Polaroid film. Uh, and so he picked up this camera and started moving through his house um, taking these photos and collaging them together. Um, and this began this whole practice of what he calls joiners. Um, they're just basically photo collages. Um, and Lawrence Weschler um, has compared these to um, the Moybridge motion studies, saying that these are very different, that this isn't like a comic book um, panel by panel type of depiction of movement. Rather, um, this represents the experience of looking um, in time as it transpires across time. Um, so what he was doing was really um, using the camera to undo the essence of everything that we understand photography to be, which is framing certain elements um, in an instant of time. Um, and something that I've, I noticed in all of the interviews um, where David Hockney talks about um, discovering a new tool or a new technology he always uses the word excited or exhilarated um, every single time. Um, so he says, from that first day I was exhilarated um, and he's just really excited that he's found this way to make this thing that he was dissatisfied with do exactly the opposite of what it normally did. Um, and he's also just really excited about um, pursuing a, a way of representing a subjective embodied experience of looking at something or someone in the world. And so uh, he also was very um, influenced by cubism. So um, he was thinking a lot about Picasso and how time um, and the idea of looking around at different sides of things was implied in those paintings. Um, and for him, cubism is really simple. If there's three noses in a painting, it means you looked at it three times. Um, and he, he says a lot that P Picasso is not, there's nothing about what he's doing that's distorted. If anything, naturalism is distorted. Um, and so one of the examples he gives uh, is he compares uh, these two paintings um, and says that um, in the first painting, because of the way perspective works, you're a voyeur. Um, and that that's, there's something actually about that that's quite unnatural. Um, and then the second one, you're kind of um, in the space here and you're in that time. Um, and that is, that is how we actually perceive things. So to him, this is more realistic. And so uh, he, he was very interested in, in capturing the act of looking in, the, in what he was depicting itself. So in this piece, uh, you can not only see this Zen garden, but you can also see uh, his system of looking where he takes one step turns, takes a row of photographs, takes another step, turns, takes another photograph. 
And I just want to emphasize that he wasn't using cameras to make photographs. He actually considers these to be drawings, um, that he's drawing in space with a camera. Um, and he just basically realized that cameras could be liberated from the traditional practice of photography. Um, he compares this realization to a situation where everyone's been using pencils um, to draw dots and that he figured out you could draw lines. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, and uh, as much as I hate the word hack, I want to posit David Hockney is the ultimate hacker um, in this case of photography. Um, he, he said that he never thought photography was a good way to make pictures, but now he saw that the camera just wasn't used right. Um, and that he was able to, <laughs> to uh, address most of his criticisms about uh, of photography by simply using it in a different way. Um, and again, just to come back to this idea of the role of the viewer, um, uh, this is, uh, I don't know if you can read in the middle here, but this is um, a photo collage of a kind of lookout point in Zion Canyon um, that says, um, you make the picture, which is the name of an exhibition that he ended up having. Um, and it says, um, the great white throne challenges photographers, amateurs, and professionals alike. Changing light and shadows change the mountain's mood and the pictures you can get. Let your imagination guide your lens. Remember that your camera only records what it's pointed at. You make the picture. Um, and so part of his interest in the, in the viewer's role in constructing what they were looking at and constructing like a, a perceived present um, was this idea that he had, um, that he would refer to as reverse perspective. And this obviously has a lot to do with cubism. Um, but he, um, he, he was very interested in researching the invention of one, one point, uh, one single vanishing point kind of um, perspective and trying to undo that. Um, and so this piece, which is probably his best known photo collage, um, which took him nine days to make and two weeks to assemble, um, he calls this a panoramic assault on Renaissance one point perspective. This is a comparison that he makes in this little video I'm about to show, um, comparing this kind of traditional one point perspective to something like a Chinese scroll, um, where the Chinese scroll doesn't have a, a single vanishing point. Um, and for that reason, it doesn't have, it doesn't suggest any particular um, viewing point. Um, and if anything, uh, as you can see here, to even show the scroll, you kind of have to use a tracking shot because it's so big. Um, but your eye is supposed to move through the space and construct the narrative, which is obviously very different than having one single perspective point suggested to you. Um, so here, here's a little video of him explaining that. The Canalesso, in a way, belongs to there's a picture like this. If this is the frame and the edge, here's a horizon, here's a road. Um, the observer, the viewer, is an immobile point outside the picture. Here, this is the viewer. That is a vanishing point, theoretically, at infinity. Um, now, if this moves, this moves. My conjecture was, uh, if the infinite is God, this and this will never connect. So they will never meet each other. Now, in reverse perspective, this happens. We now have, instead of that triangle, a triangle doing this. Here now is a point, and this is the spectator who is not immobile because he can see both sides. He is in movement, like we think we're in movement. And infinity is now everywhere, including the viewer. God is everywhere, including within you. It seems to make more theological sense. Um, OK, um, so <laughs> I'm going to skip forward. Um, so, so that's an example of, uh, of him, uh, the way that he was working with photography. Um, but then, uh, and, and also, I, I, don't, I don't have an example of this here, but um, this whole time, he's still painting. So you see his paintings are starting to be influenced by those photo collages. And it's just kind of this back and forth reverberation. Like, he's a very interdisciplinary artist. Um, so uh, later on, he discovers um, copiers, photocopiers. Um, and again, he says, when I made the discovery of how to use copying machines to make prints from no pre-existing image, I was very, very excited. Um, and so he's excitedly making these prints. And um, what's really interesting is he was approaching the copier as a painter and a printmaker. 
Um, so he not only had to learn to paint in a certain way to get this to work, but he also would run the same um, very nice quality paper through the same copier, sometimes up to 12 times. Um, he at one point worked with technicians at Canon um, in Japan just to create a yellow that no one had ever used before. Um, and he says people said they were just bad printing machines, but I think there's no such thing. Um, and then he discovers fax machines, just like in my story. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the thing he got excited about here was um, uh, the idea that you could send these to people instantly, which um, it's hard to remember now that that seemed very magical, <laughs> um, but it is, um, and, it, and it could be. Um, and so, and I, I guess what I mean to say is he, he recognized that what was magical about the fax machine was simply its ability to, to connect people, but that desire to connect other people is actually really old. Um, and so um, it's not, uh, it's not so much that he was trying to subvert the usual dullness of fax machines as that he seemed genuinely unaffected by it. Um, and so this um, ability of his to reimagine the fax machine as something that, um, that can connect people, that you can send beautiful things through, um, is what makes it a utopian fax machine to me. Um, and like with the copier, he had to, he was constantly iterating back and forth, so he was having to really study the way the fax machine picks up um, these images and learn to paint in a way for the fax machine. So, um, you know, like on the one hand, he might have said, you know, like I hate photography, but then he got very interested in, in some of the details of photography. And in this case, um, he realized that, that to make the thing do what he wanted it to do and not what it normally does, he would have to learn a lot about the fax machine. Um, so when he found out that it could skew images, he sent mind bending faxes. Um, and then he uh, wanted to send a, a painting that was bigger than the fax machine, so he figured out this way of um, mapping it out um, and then sending the instructions of how to assemble your painting um, as the cover sheet of the fax machine. Um, so you get a really giant um, thing like this. Um, and then he went through a period of making some very strange computer, draw computer paintings. Um, and you will not find these on Google Images. I had to get these from the Stanford Art Library. Um, and this was made on an Apple Mac II FX computer using Oasis software. Um, and uh, this is him at the um, 1990 Photoshop Invitational. Um, <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then of course, you know, like he's now known for these iPad paintings, um, which are really beautiful. And again, um, they, when you, s when you see them in a museum, I mean, they're just, they're, you realize that they're just really good art prints, um, that the, the iPad is sort of incidental. Um, so what I actually want to talk more about though, is uh, this piece. So this is the reason I had to give this, um, talk at the de Young. Um, so this is, uh, basically it was a series of videos that he made or video installations called seven Yorkshire landscapes. Um, and Yorkshire is where, um, it's around where he's from, so it's a, it's a landscape that has a lot of personal meaning to him. Um, and what it basically, if you haven't seen it, it's um, a grid of monitors that are all playing, uh, each one is playing footage that was taken from a different camera that was mounted also in a grid on the side of a car. Uh, so um, kind of weirdly like Street View, um, but very different. Um, and it looks here like it's a continuous image, but it's not. There's actually some disconnection between the panels. So um, it kind of tricks your eye into looking at everything really closely. It also means that you have to attend equally to each panel um, that you, it suggests that there's something to, there's enough to look at in each, in each panel. Um, and so um, it's really hard to find <laughs> um, videos of this. So this is like some person's kids um, hanging out in front of the, this installation. But in a way, it might actually um, help illustrate this point that it's, it's, um, it's really strangely engaging, um, even though it's moving really slowly. Um, and he said, uh, this is a quote from Hockney, the composition stays the same and you just slowly go past a bush. There's so much to look at that you don't get bored. Everybody watches because there's a lot to see. There's a lot to look at. Um, and then he compares it to TV saying, um, if you show the world better, it's more beautiful, a lot more beautiful. The process of looking is the beauty. Um, and something that he notes um, is that they, they couldn't just go out and buy this setup because no one was doing it this way. Um, so he says, we have found a way of making the technology work for us. Um, those behind the technology know that they need these mad people to come along and find ways of using it. Um, and so this is his like complicated car, little car rig. Um, and something that I find really endearing is that um, even while he's in the car, he's making iPad paintings of the camera rig. Um, so he just like kind of can't stop like noting down these things that he's seeing. 
Uh, but something I, I think is the most important to me about this um, is uh, after the talk, I talked to some of the docents about um, kind of hanging out with this piece and also talking to visitors about their experience with the piece. Um, and numerous people had said that when they went outside, nothing looked the same. Um, and I can personally attest to this because I saw the piece and then I, I left the museum and it just hap so happens to be next to a botanical garden. Um, and I've been to that botanical garden. I really like it. I'm sure I've looked at things very carefully there. Um, but I, I did not experience that way of looking until after I engaged with this piece. I really needed the piece to provide this kind of um, prosthesis um, in order to be able to see this way on my own. And it has something to do with this kaleidoscopic luxuriating in textures that the that the video is doing um, and so uh, so I think this is a really good example of Hockney's ongoing interest in looking as a positive act which he says um, is something that you have to decide to do um, and that the familiar and proximate environment is always worthy of this type of attention from you um, so that's um, kind of what I found looking into Hockney's work and um, and something that it made me think about um, these are more little drawings, um, uh, is how um, he's using technology or digital tools in an unconventional way um, that always just so happens to place us back in the physical world. Um, and, and it seems to me that a lot of the s devices and technology that we interact with can be used in diametrically opposed ways. So um, one is in that way of um, opening the world up to you more, and the other one is shielding you from it. Um, and so and this is a heavy-handed example, but you know, like a constellation identifying app versus people on the Muni, some percentage of whom are definitely playing Candy Crush. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I was thinking about this kind of like what... Um, I was interested in his work as an example of something that, that does, does the first part. Um, but uh, I don't want this to seem like just another finger-waggling diatribe about how we all use our phones too much, um, or an especially Californian be here now kind of message. Um, I want to suggest an outcome that lies beyond observation for observation's sake, um, and that has to do with sensibility um, and rendering the world more sensible to oneself and to others. Um, and I'm interested in kind of three categories um, of what could be rendered more sensible. I think probably Hockney's work is only dealing with really the first one of these, um, so I want to show some examples of the others. Um, but these are um, kind of like layers of experience that can be rendered more or less sensible um, through experiences with art and other things. Um, so the first example I'm going to show um, is, of, is of the rendering the physical environment more sensible, and it's a piece called Living Symphonies. Um, I'll just let the video explain this part. So, um, and I, I just wanted to play that video because I think the sound is important. Um, but the thing that I really love about this piece is um, how utopian the documentation is. So it's a lot of photos of people just like staring dreamily into the trees or lying on logs. Um, and it's, it's definitely a technologically mediated experience, but it's one that if anything gives people more access to their physical present than would be possible otherwise. Um, I think it's also important in this case that you have to physically go there to experience the piece. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of that first category. Um, the second category um, 
My example for this is a piece by Camille Utterbach um, called Entangled, and it was uh, commissioned for the Contemporary Jewish Museum last year. Um, and as you can see here, it's basically a set of scrims um, that people can interact with on either side. Um, so what you're doing on in front of the scrim that you're in front of is changing what's showing up on that, that scrim, um, but it's not necessarily, um, it's what you're doing in, fr in front of your screen is not affecting the other screen. Um, and so there's a complex interaction between what you're doing and the, what the other person is doing. But what you're doing also, um, after you leave, kind of stays there a little bit, almost like condensation, and then um, slowly and organically kind of goes away. So when you walk up to the screen, um, what you're seeing is, um, b is affected by the person that was there before you. Um, also, uh, it's a bit hard to see here, but um, the pattern is made up of um, these kind of like subtle motifs of the, sometimes you'll see like earbuds or computer cables. Um, and uh, Camille has said about this um, that I was thinking about this idea of how entangled we are literally with our technology, but how hopefully this piece entangles you more physically with people in the space. Um, and she also says that um, obviously in this case, your the effects of your actions are constrained visually to this um, piece, but that you would extrapolate outward from that and ask, um, how are my actions affecting all of the systems I par I'm part of as a human in a society? Um, and then um, as an example of a piece that um, renders um, what I'm calling the historical um, dimension of the present more sensible, um, so being able to think of the present not as this kind of like um, given thing that's just like it's just Tuesday and you know it's just another day but really like starting to think about how that's a historical moment um, just like any other moment um, is this piece by Erica Molesworth um, which I, I'm gonna have to talk over for the sake of time um, but it's basically this very surreal tracking shot of a rooftop garden um, on top of a tech company in Silicon Valley um, and it uh, I encourage you to watch this on your own time. There's this kind of like heavenly music playing in the background. Um, and then there's um, a narration where she's basically talking about the evolution of the modern knowledge worker. Um, and so she says, the new breed of worker was a knowledge worker and different kinds of landscapes were needed to attract these workers. Um, and, and then she just kind of describes, like she's just simply describing what's there. She's, she notes that it's meant to emulate the, the surrounding hills, that it incorporates over 400 native Californian trees and 100,000 drought, drought resistant, or drought, drought tolerant plants. Um, and what I find really amazing about this piece is it doesn't, um, I think it's a, it's a really good example of the power of simply observing something. Um, it makes the historical dimension of, of this um, situation more palpable um, because it contextualizes the landscape within the history of architecture and the ways of thinking about work, um, but also because any naturalness of this landscape completely breaks down under such a sustained gaze. Um, the slowness of the tracking shot I think is really important and it alienates you not only from the landscape but also from the present um, and it allows you to see it both from the past and from the future. So it's really hard to watch this and not come to the conclusion that we live in a very strange moment. Um, <laughs> And a lot of that has to do um, with, the, with that slowness. And I think all three of these examples rely a lot on this kind of slowing you down. Um, it's certainly slower than uh, is characteristic for our um, thinking about or interacting with technology, maybe. Um, so uh, those are some examples, and I could talk about many more, but I think like those kind of outline those three categories I was talking about. Um, so just to talk about um, how this has affected my um, very recent work, um, I, uh, I'm going to criminally, criminally shorten uh, my explanation of this particular project um, just for the sake of time, but if anyone wants to talk trash with me literally afterwards, I'm here. Um, but uh, last year I was an artist in residence at a dump, or sorry, it's a resource recovery um, facility, um, uh, which is <laughs> um, Recology in San Francisco. It's really great if you're ever, if you live in the Bay Area or you're passing through, you should definitely go on a tour. Um, so they've had this long running artist residency program um, and my approach was to run the one person Bureau of Suspended Objects out of the studio that I was given um, for three months. Uh, and the Bureau of Suspended Objects has only one goal, which is to um, archive, as much, uh, archive as many objects as possible. Um, so what this meant for me was um, going into the pile, as we called it, um, and picking up um, objects out of this indistinct mass of recently discarded objects. 
um, with my shopping cart, which I was given. So this is a normal day with my shopping cart. Um, and so I would take these objects back to my studio. Um, I'd photograph them from various angles. Um, and then I would spend um, what ended up into the residency becoming like an untenably um, long amount of time researching each object. Um, so that meant where it was manufactured, when, why, what is it made out of, uh, what does that company make now, do they still exist, um, is there, can I find street view of the factory, um, why do people like this thing, what are the product reviews, is there a TV commercial, like what was it worth then, what is it worth now, like just every possible question. So um, I would end up with something like this for um, 200 objects. Um, and so all of this information, I was just doing this over and over again, um, day after day. All of the information ended up on um, a website. Um, this is kind of like in a good example of the amount of information. And the website's actually better because it has links. You can go and watch the TV commercial or you can go look at the factory. Um, but it's also in a book um, just for the sake of archiving. Um, and so, I mean, you, you can probably see there like what that has in common with the satellite collections is just kind of staring at something for so long that it becomes very strange and really um, not taking things for granted and really thoroughly questioning something that seems banal or everyday or that you didn't even notice. Um, and just using the decontextualization that's already happening in the dump as an opportunity to do that. Um, so, uh, and this is like leading up to my um, research into Hockney's. Um, I had this problem with my exhibition, which was basically that um, it ended up being a lot more about technology than I wanted it to be. Um, I wanted to use it, um, but uh, the point of it was supposed to be to think about the objects. So um, as you can see here, people are like scanning various things. Um, I know that no one uses QR codes, but um, I, it was the most efficient way for me to um, ha you know, let, let someone walk up to an object and scan it and then read all of the information about it and like look at the factory or whatnot. Um, so you could, you know, just treat it like a library and you could go and scan things and read about them. Um, I also used augmented reality to um, show the new versions of objects overlaid on top of them. Um, and I think it's important to note here that uh, I used um, Layer, which I don't know if anyone here has used, but it's, it's supposed to be for advertisers. So it thinks that this is my ad campaign and that the things showing up on top are my advertising content, um, which I especially enjoy using for trash. Um, and uh, <laughs> another thing that I used it for was this, um, you could scan some of the prints, like these are all the things made in Asia, and then it would show you like where all of those things were from. Um, but this is actually a really good example of this problem that I had, which was, um, I guarantee you no one read any of those labels. <laughs> um, and I don't really think that people were looking at either the images on the wall or the ones that were showing up on their phones. I think the message ended up being, um, this artist used augmented reality, that's so cool. Um, like, and it was so annoying because I had done all this work to, to make someone have a different experience of an object, um, and it ended up really being more about this than anything else. Um, and so, uh, so that was kind of the issue that I was dealing with, um, and that's why I ended up being so inspired by, this, like, by Hockney's way of using technology without fetishizing it. Um, around this time, I also had a very fateful encounter with George Perec. Um, and uh, so this is after the exhibition. Um, and it was kind of, he's kind of one of those people that I don't know how I've gone this long without encountering. It's kind of crazy. Um, but he was um, a writer who's also um, famously very into the act of looking, um, specifically looking in places that are habitually overlooked, um, kind of tuning your ear so you can hear the very textures of your everyday life. Um, and a lot of his writing takes on the form of these instructions, just telling you where to look, like um, what is there under your wallpaper. Um, and uh, this is a little excerpt from a piece of his called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris. Um, and he just goes to the same table, I think three days in a row, and writes, just writes down everything that happens. Um, and about this he says, um, a great number, if not the majority of these things have been described, inventoried, uh, these things being, he, he talks about some of the buildings that are in that area, and businesses. Um, inventoried, photographed, talked about, or registered. My intention in the pages that follow was to describe the rest instead. That which is generally not taken note of, that which is not noticed, that which has no importance, what happens when nothing happens other than the weather, people, cars, and clouds. Um, and so, um, so I had this encounter, um, and then um, 
Also around that time, I got the chance to take over this space in the Contemporary Jewish Museum, um, which is this kind of like long glass display case thing. Um, normally looks like this, and they give it to one artist and one um, non-artist, whatever that means, um, to collaborate. Um, and it's based on the Jewish practice of Havruta, which is um, reading two people reading the same text and debating it. Um, and so I was given the space, and they said I could collaborate with whoever I wanted. And um, what I was thinking about, like reading, you know, reading Parek and um, thinking about this Hockney thing, um, I was thinking about how when I'd been at the dump, the role of context was really important and how literally changing your perception of things. Um, the couple times that I went to Walmart in the middle of being a resident at the dump were very surreal um, because like the Wal Walmart obviously looks like trash. Um, and then the dump, I literally have a shopping cart and the things are higher quality so, and I get them for free. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I was thinking about that, um, and I'm just, you know, like that I was seeing the same object in different stages of its life. Um, I was also thinking about how I used to work at Gap Corporate in the visual merchandising, and my job was to take pictures in this fake store um, that was basically all of Gap stores in North America set two months in the future. Um, and I had coworkers who would get things out of boxes, like samples from like Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, and fold them in a certain way or hang them in a certain way where suddenly they're worth $50. Um, and so that in its own way is almost like a contextualization lab was the way I was thinking about it. Um, so I decided that I wanted to work with a window designer. Um, so I ended up wor working with Philip Buscemi, who's in the middle here. And Philip works for Ken Folk, who's the guy on the right. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Ken Folk, um, Ken Folk does um, interior design and party planning for like the tech elite of the Bay Area. So like Sean Parker's Game of Thrones wedding, um, the battery, like just kind of um, people with like nouveau riche like need to decorate their Tahoe cabin. Um, it's like that's what Ken Folk does. Um, so I talked to Philip and I said, okay, what I want to do is I want to have three categories of objects. Um, one is new things bought from Walmart, Target, and um, Hobby Lobby. Um, and then uh, things that I own or like things that are used and then things from the dump. And I want to design a display that makes people see them all in the same way. Um, so this is what he ended up making. Um, those are the three categories. Um, so, uh, and there's like some intentional echoes in here. Like there's, um, there's a new pine cone, but there's also a used pine cone. Um, the new pine cone I bought from Walmart, the used one my mom found on the side of the street and had in her house. And they're from the exact same species of tree. Um, there's two fake apples, like the shoes are in the same place. We were really like trying to hit people over the head with this. Um, and so this is, and yes, that is an annoying orange plush <laughs> thing that I found at the dump <laughs> that talks when you squeeze it. Um, so, and, and each section had like, the, you know, the a book that was accompanying it with all the kind of information that I was used to researching. Um, so some combination of this and Parekh and Hockney all kind of like came together at this time um, in a way that I, I noticed very specifically with one object. Um, and this is um, an award my mom was given at HP in 2000, I think. Um, and um, so this is a very familiar object to me. I grew up, it was just, I was vaguely aware of it. It's like on the mantle next to other things I'm vaguely aware of, never really questioned it. Um, so it was really, really surreal to apply this kind of monomaniacal research that I'd been doing to this very familiar thing. Um, and so very quickly I realized that the, it's made out of onyx, which is from Pakistan. It was engraved um, at all sports trophies in Fort Collins, Colorado. It was given to my mom at an HP campus, um, which is um, in the process, or is, has, has just been demolished um, to make way for the Apple Spaceship campus. Um, and then of course, the and my mom found this video. Um, and, uh, and then of course, the garage that it refers to is a real garage in Palo Alto, um, this HP garage. Um, so it just finding out that all of this stuff was always inside of this object that I had looked at many times but never questioned was really akin to, like I can only compare it to finding out that like, your friend is really good at karaoke or something, but like knowing them for like 10 years and then it was not until you were in that situation where it turns out that they have this whole like thing that you don't know about. Um, like it was really destabilizing. Um, and um, I couldn't help but think about Hockney's um, talking about cubism and looking at something from multiple angles at once, um, that this method of looking somehow feels more alive and true than a frozen picture of something. Um, and already at the dump, the context of objects had exploded for me, but now the object itself was exploding um, and becoming this unstable and specific intersection of flows, um, historical flows and material flows. Um, and, and so I really started to think about um, 
not going through a portal um, to look at another dimension, but rather the act of looking itself as the portal. So Hockney had that show called You Make the Picture, and I would maybe borrow that here to say You Make the Portal, um, and ask myself whether augmented reality wasn't simply deciding to look at something or listen to something more carefully or at all. Um, and I started to think about what technologies of seeing or perceiving might really mean, like a broader understanding of that. Obviously, there are things that allow us to see at a scale that is not available, available to humans, but there are also things like Duchamp's fountain, which made us see things in a urinal that we could not have seen otherwise. Um, likewise, we have things that are more overtly technological, like hearing aids. Um, but I went to go see a John Cage performance at the Symphony Hall um, in San Francisco a couple years ago, and I felt like I was wearing hearing aids when I left because I was hearing all of these sounds that in a city that I'd lived in for many years um, for the first time. Um, and so, uh, and I think um, it's significant that when I kind of like if you think back to those portals um, that I was showing at the beginning with the zapping and whatnot, um, my, my kind of grown up favorite version of that um, is this movie called Exchange, which has no plot except that a guy just comes home in the middle of the day and things look weird. And then he just spends the rest of the movie like standing in weird places and throwing like a stapler out the window um, just to like see what happens. Um, like the world has just suddenly become very weird to him. Um, and that, that he didn't go through a portal, that was a decision. He just made a decision to um, perceive something um, different. Um, and so that, uh, that brings me to what I'm doing this summer really quickly. Um, it's still the Bureau of Suspended Objects. If you're in Palo Alto, please come visit me. I'm gonna be in residence at the Palo Alto Art Center. Um, and I'm having people come in and bring me what I'm calling pre-trash. So it's something that you've psychologically thrown away, but have not for s probably an interesting reason. Um, and then, so you come in and you fill out this form and the questions are things like, you know, like obviously when did you get it? Why, what did it mean to you? Where did you keep it in your house or your car, or your office? Wh what was it next to? What did it mean to you? Uh, why don't you like it anymore? Um, what's your guilt level one to 10? Um, are you buying another one? Um, and uh, so you will fill this out um, and then you'll leave the object with me in this giant plexi cube that they're building me. So it'll just fill up with everyone's stuff. Um, and then uh, a couple weeks later in the mail, you'll get um, a nice kind of isolated photograph of your thing. Um, you'll get your carbon copy of this. Um, and then you'll get an information packet that's all of the manufacturing stuff, stuff that the Bureau of Suspended Objects does. Um, and I'm also thinking about doing these like really amateur 3D models of people's objects and then having them rotate in this kind of like digital purgatory. Um, <laughs> just so that like, just the weirdness of me like sitting on my computer, like really trying to figure out your object. Um, and so, yeah, and that's, um, I, I think like this, the, this encounter with like this idea of looking, the decision to look, um, the reason my work has kind of shifted over this way is because it, I realized that um, my work didn't really have meaning to me unless I could create that moment for someone else personally, that someone could have a personally familiar object and really like personally have the experience of being like, wow, I've never really looked at this thing or I was looking at it from a really specific um, angle. And um, it's my small effort to make things in the world more sensible. Um, so really quick to end, just um, why why this is important to me. Um, why is it important to attend to the present or make the present sensible? Um, one reason is that the world is weird enough. Um, I think uh, as if you just start paying attention to things, um, everything reveals itself to be quite strange and bizarre and fantastical. Um, second is that um, we are responsible to the present and we're responsible to each other in the present. Um, and so uh, I, there's something about the way that we currently use technology that bothers me. It kind of denigrates the present in, in favor of the future, and the future is always imag imagined as something abstract that's far away with other people somewhere else. Um, and that's just simply not true. This is, this is where we live. We are, we are here. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, I really truly believe that a study of the present is a study of the future. Um, I don't think, like I said, I don't think the future is this abstract thing far away. I think the future is literally constituted of new perspectives on the present, um, on things that are around us right now. Um, and this probably explains why, um, as is clear right now, I'm more impressed by novel uses of familiar technology than familiar uses of novel technology. Um, and also, not only in seeing technology differently, but using um, technology to see the world differently or more. Um, so that brings me back to uh, the title of my talk, Utopian Fax Machines. Um, Hockney, uh, something I found recently that Hockney said about this was that um, the fa fax machines seem to have, um, quote, an aspect of high technology um, that brought back intimacy, which to me is the only reality. 
Um, and so I just wanted to um, suggest that all machines are p potentially utopian depending on how we use them um, and insofar as they help us to see and access utopian possibilities that are already exist here um, among us in the world. Um, and that we ask ourselves as makers, users, and consumers of technology, is this making me more or less alive? Is this putting me more in the world or taking me out of it? And so just as one, one last Hockney quote, um, uh, talking about a very different type of technology, which is a car. Um, I just want to read you something that Hockney said about um, convertibles. Um, so it's not the journey that counts, or it's the journey that counts, not the destination. In the 60s, American car manufacturers for 20 years never made a convertible car because Ralph Nader said they were unsafe. A lot of people thought it was right to stop making them. And I pointed out that this argument is terrible because what he's saying is that the destination is more important than the journey. He'll get you there safe, but you'll be in a tank, sealed. Well, I'd like to look at the trees on the way. I want to enjoy the journey because I know perfectly well what the destination is, oblivion. So meanwhile, I'd like to be able to see the world. Thanks. <laughs>